Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, released in 1988. The Dream Master continues the story from Dream Warriors, featuring the surviving characters from that movie, like Joey and Kincaid, and wait, who's that blonde chick? Oh, I guess that's supposed to be Kristen Parker, now played by Tuesday Night instead of Patricia Arquette, for reasons people weirdly can't seem to agree upon, even though I think it's just because she was pregnant. After Dream Warriors made Freddy mainstream, The Dream Master turned him into the hero of the series, an experience experienced Finnish director Renny Harlan wanted Freddy to be a cool guy, quote, like James Bond, and so the one-liners continued and increased. The screenplay was seriously hampered by a writer's strike going on at the time, meaning some scenes weren't written until hours before being shot, and Harlan wound up relying more on surreal dream visuals than a storyline that makes any sense. But that's okay, those cool visuals led to some pretty sweet kills, so let's get to them. The movie begins with a quote, cause I guess that's what we're doing in this series now. Kristen Mark II comes across a little girl in her chalk art exhibit of the Elm Street house before Mother Nature washes it away like a goddamn Philistine. And now the house is standing right in front of her, complete with some jump rope girls and a ball and boy backup performer. Kristen winds up inside the house, unable to escape it as the doors play funhouse tricks on her. And then Tuesday Night speaks to herself aloud to let the audience know she is the Kristen now. Be calm, Kristen. A storm blows her back all the way into a boiler room, which spooks her out so much she ends up calling on our boy Kincaid and pulling him into her dream. Oh shit, Kristen, not again! And also Joey, who's looking much older and is talking a bunch more. They tell Kristen that she needs to quit pulling them into her dreams, because Freddy's dead and they're trying to get some goddamn sleep. Looks like they may be right, since the only thing that attacks them in this dream is Kincaid's dog, who bites Kristen's arm. Oh yeah, the dog's name is Jason. Wonder if that's a reference to anything. The next morning, Kristen goes to pick up her friend Alice Johnson, whose dad is a real prick. You going out dressed like that? Dude, she looks like she's going to a Catholic parish bake sale. What's your problem? That dad is so douchey, Alice's brother Rick exits his house through a window just to avoid and gives Kristen a smooch because that's her boyfriend. They get to school and meet up with her friend Debbie, who stands there eye-fucking this jock Dan from across the parking lot. Looks like Alice is a Dan fan too. You know, you are one major league hunk. Thanks, Alice. Even if she only has that kind of confidence in her daydreams. Another friend, Sheila, rolls up on a smoky moped type deal, and judging by her big old glasses and asthma condition, it's obvious this chick's a nerd. But she a cutie, too. There's a seemingly random moment where Debbie finds a bug in her bag of chips and gets super grossed out, and is literally just here to shoehorn in a character trait for Frey to use in a kill later. That happens a lot in this movie. Looks like Kincaid and Joey go to the same school, having successfully reintegrated into society after being chased around a psych ward by a dream demon. They tell new Kristen to let sleeping Freddy's lie, and that there's no reason reason to keep using her dream power anymore. After they leave for class, Rick calls them a bunch of weirdos, but might want to check the color of that kettle, dude, because you're the one doing an extended karate kid practice session to some drama-rama in the garage that night. Maybe this is just his way of dealing with having such a piss-poor excuse for a parent. Looking for something? Oh, no, Papa. Nothing except your love and approval. But instead, Daddy Johnson just berates Alice about the dinner she made for him. You call this vegetation a meal after a 10-hour workday? What the hell am I, a rabbit? Yeah, could we get Freddy in this dude's dreams ASAP? Alice seemingly takes matters into her own hands but it's just another daydream. What's up with this chick? She's dreaming so much, she may just be a master of it by now. Oh, I think I get it. Speaking of dreams, Kincaid falls asleep and wakes up in one of his own, in the trunk of a car at the junkyard from the last movie, and Jason the dog seems to be digging up some old bones. Obviously, we're about to get Freddy back, but I wonder how they'll do it specifically. Oh, the dog pisses fire. Okay. Kincaid, you gotta stop putting kerosene in the kibble, man. The fire cracks open the ground, where Freddy's skeleton is lying in pieces, but not for long. It reassembles itself and begins to grow organs and skin and blood in a manner very similar to Frank Cotton in Hellraiser which had just come out the year before. Interesting. More fire gives Freddy his glove back, and with the donning of a dirty fedora, it looks like we're Looney Tunes back in action. You shouldn't have buried me. I'm not dead. He uses his powers to possess a bunch of junk vehicles, which trap Kincaid in the middle of a car maze so big and confusing that you could probably use it to trap a hotel-possessed father. Then he appears right next to Kincaid and stabs him in the gut. Fred stabs him again and is all like, There, there, Kincaid. I know. We're killing you off way too early in this movie. And with the third and final stab, we see Kincaid dying in his bed as his poor pup wonders what's happening to his human. Aw, poor Jason. Maybe if you wait 15 years, you can get revenge on Freddy. Well, if we got rid of Kincaid, might as well get rid of Joey, too. He's fallen asleep with his MTV and steals a peep at this bikini model on the wall right before drifting off to dreamland. In his dreams, his water bed's like a wave pool. And inside that bed is the woman of his very horny dreams. Before he can figure out a way to breach the barrier between them, though, she sinks away. And up comes Freddy, who's got the most obvious one-liner in store for this kill. How's this for a wet dream? He pulls Joey into the water bed and kills him with his finger knives. A pretty basic kill for Kruger, albeit a wet rendition. But at least we get this nice shot of a bloody waterbed at the end of it. And there's another cool shot when his mom comes in his room later to find him dead in the bed, thanks to Fred. The next day, Kristen's smoking a stress cigarette, and she chats with Alice about how they've both been having nightmares. Then Alice drops the movie's title on us. Did you ever hear of the Dream Master? It's a rhyme. Just have to dream about someplace fun. Remember, you're in control. I, 
I don't get it. Was that the rhyme or? But instead of explaining herself more thoroughly, the two of them just keep incessantly talking about their dreams like they're a couple of young actors who just moved to LA. Actors. When they go to class, Kristen sees that both Kincaid and Joey are missing, so she freaks out, all right, and winds up knocking herself out in the corner. She comes to in the nurse's office, but does that lady look a little English to you? Yeah, she does, cause she's Robert England and that nurse is Freddy. I wanna draw some blood. But Kristen would prefer a proper phlebotomist, so she wakes up from that nightmare and that's that. Apparently Alice works at this Back to the Future style diner where Dan Dan the Handsome Man stops by looking for her brother, cause I guess he and Rick are buds. Debbie, meanwhile, wants to be more than buds with Dan and wonders aloud where he works out. I mean, there is life after exercise. Yeah, that line is another shoehorned character trait for Deb, since apparently these filmmakers have never heard of Show Don't Tell. Rick and Kristen rush in with breaking news, Kincaid and Joey dead overnight. Find out more in Act 2. They take Alice and Dapper Dan to Freddy's house, where Rick talks about Kruger's backstory in case anyone in the audience was still in the dark during the fourth fucking movie of the series. The house prompts Alice to remember the Dream Master ride. Now I lay me down to sleep, the master of dreams, my soul I'll keep. The Dream Master, I think I remember the rhyme. Okay, wait, so that's the rhyme? Is that it? Before we can explore what the fuck Alice is talking about, Kristen's mom starts honking at them and doing her best Speedy Gonzales impression. On delay! On delay! On delay! They have dinner where Kristen's mom pretends that Tuesday night has always been her daughter, Patricia who, and drugs her with sleeping pills because it's way easier to parent when your kid's unconscious. Kristen runs up to her room where some well done overhead camera movements really capture the feel of someone falling asleep while fighting to stay awake. Kristen loses the fight and wakes up on a beach, but there's something speeding around the water just offshore. Is it a shark? Is it a dolphin? Nope, it's a Freddy glove and it's headed right for us! Freddy blows up a sandcastle and appears on the beach, and when Kristen tries to run away, she winds up in some quicksand. Freddy's all like, deal with it, bitch! And steps on her head to push her down through the sand. You'd think that might be it, but nah, she crashes through a ceiling and we're back in that fucking house? God damn it. Hey, Elm Street franchise? Yeah, we don't actually care that much about the house. We're here for Freddy. Kristen runs downstairs and surprise, surprise, she's in a boiler room where Freddy appears and tells her to call one of her friends into the dream because the more the merrier. Kristen doesn't want to, but she accidentally summons Alice, who joins her in the boiler room. How sweet. Fresh meat. She gets there just in time to see Freddy toss Kristen into a furnace and show off his nasty soul chest. Then, okay, follow me here if you can. Kristen's all like, yo Alice, you'll need my dream power. Direct quote. And throws a spirit ball or something into Freddy, who then regurgitates that shit like an owl pellet back into Alice. So yeah, I guess that happened. Alice wakes up and finds a postcard picture from Freddy, so she grabs Rick and they run to Kristen's house. Sure enough, there's a light over at the Kristen Parker place. And that light is a raging inferno that they find consuming Kristen in bed. Bummer. Just like that, all the dream warriors are dead. But who will be our main character? Oh, probably the Dream Master chick, huh? Kristen is buried in the Springwood protagonist cemetery, and her death leaves Alice feeling different, as she tells Rick. Something happened in the dream, and now it's like... Part of her is with me. Must be the part with the nicotine addiction, because at school the next day, Alice goes to light up in the bathroom, only stopping when she realizes, I don't smoke. You sure you didn't light up in that classroom too, Alice? Cause this place looks hazier than a Sterling Cooper boardroom. With the big test underway, Sheila learns that she might not have studied the proper material. And how exactly is this happening? Well, because Alice is a real C- student and fell asleep in class, apparently pulling Sheila into her dream. The test really starts to consume Sheila. Her arm gets pulled into the paper, and then an Inspector Gadget robot arm nonsense comes out and grabs her in the face. Watch it, Sheila. I don't think Professor Freddy's gonna appreciate all this class clowning around. He walks over to the star pupil and gets pretty predatory with her. There's that classic tongue waggle. Let's hear one of your famous Freddy one-liners. Wanna suck the face? And with that, he starts sucking all the air right out of her, collapsing her dream body in a real gnarly way and leaving it looking like a Sheila-shaped hot water pad. In real life, Sheila's fully inflated but unable to breathe, and she dies in the classroom from lack of air. Alice realizes that she pulled Sheila into her dream and got her killed, so she runs away from her friends in an awkward crying mess. Her brother chases after her, looking like he's part of the breakfast club. That night, Dan comes to the diner to ask Alice why exactly Freddy might be after her. Maybe Freddy. Can't get to the new kids unless there's someone to bring them to him. At school the next day, we get our obligatory Bob Shea cameo as he lectures on about more Dream Master bullshit, but none of it even makes any goddamn sense. Alice falls asleep in class while Rick falls asleep on the toilet, which can definitely happen if you're tired enough. Trust me, I know. Rick starts having a Freddy nightmare with a personal cheer squad in the stall. But wait a minute, I thought Alice could pull people into dreams without the other person falling asleep? Why'd we need Rick to fall asleep? This fucking movie, man. Rick finds himself in a bathroom that looks like it'd be part of an underground club in 80s New York. Chris 
assistance there, but she's all burny, gross. And then the stall turns into an elevator that transports Rick down to a karate dojo. In one of the dumbest scenes of the franchise, Rick fights an invisible Freddy, swinging his limbs around wildly, accompanied by cheesy sound effects. This literally happened because they ran out of money and had already filmed Rick's funeral scene, so they needed to kill him off somehow. Look at how cheap this set looks. It's just a bunch of fucking bed sheets. So dumb. Eventually, the finger knife glove, minus one Freddy Krueger, launches itself into Rick's gut and kills him, ending the life of our pantomiming Ralph Macchio. Ralph Macchio? Business is booming for Springwood coffin makers. During Rick's funeral, Alice has a daydream where we get this unfortunate moment. Hello, baby. Oh god, please make a stop. There's really no point to this Rick hallucination, so we'll just stick him back in the coffin and pretend like that never happened. Now the only friends Alice has left are Dan and Debbie, and we don't even know anything about these two. I mean, look, I don't spend hours working out to let some, some Night Stalker beat me. Oh yeah, that's right. Debbie's apparently into exercise. Even though we're an hour into this movie, and we've seen no visible evidence of that. At home, Alice demonstrates that she's still absorbing the paper-thin character traits of her dead friends and family, because now she's good at karate. Or at least her stunt double is. Alice goes to meet Dan at the diner, but when he's not there, I guess she decides it's a good time to take in a movie. Ooh, Reefer Madness. I hope it's the Kristen Bell one. Nah, it looks like it's the one from the 30s, which is actually a little inside joke, since Bob Shea had distributed copies of that movie to help finance New Line Cinema early on. But then the movie turns into a reel of the diner gone desolate, and Alice's snacks start getting sucked towards the screen. Yo, killing is one thing, Freddy, but that soda probably costs like 10 bucks, alright? Not cool. Eventually, the movie pulls Alice herself into the screen, in a great effect. This movie may be nonsensical, but it does have some cool visuals. She looks out at herself sleeping in the theater like it's one of those crazy shots from Dreamcatcher, and inside the diner finds an old version of herself. What does she come across next, a monolith and the space baby? Freddy shows up and gets his order of meatball pizza. Bet you got a couple of jokes lined up for us here, huh, Fred? Rick, you little meatball. I love soul food. Aw, oh, sick. And then he eats that little Rick ball? Gross. He tells Alice to bring in more victims, and she accidentally opens the door to Debbie, who, holy shit, is actually working out, even though her form is pretty suspect. That is one narrow friggin' grip you've got there, Deb. Alice gets back to the diner. She and Dan get into the truck. They rush to go save Debbie. And Deb's too busy with her gains to notice Freddy's come to spot her. Alice and Dan get to Deb's house. Alice runs across the lawn to save Deb, then Alice gets back to the diner. She and Dan get into the truck. They rush to go save Debbie. And Deb finds Freddy giving her some resistance training and delivering the obvious no pain, no gain line as he rips her arms apart at the elbow. I absolutely love this effect. It's so well done that it's almost hard to watch. Look at them floppy broken arms. Then, because Freddy wants to work both of Debbie's shoehorned character traits into her death, he makes it so cockroach arms sprout out of her stumps and her shoulders. And there goes a hand. The transformation leaves Deb running around a dim hallway looking like a rejected Spider-Man villain. Alice and Dan get to Deb's house. Alice runs across the lawn to save Deb, then Alice gets back to the diner. She and Dan get into the truck. They rush to go save Debbie. Deb finds herself inside a roach motel, looking out at her empty bench and no doubt thinking about all the reps she's missing out on. Her feet get trapped in that nasty sap stuff, and then she falls face first into it. When she tries to lift her head out of the glue, her face just comes straight off. Nice, completing her buggy transformation. Meanwhile, Alice gets back to the diner, but before she and Dan can get into the truck, they finally catch on to the fact that they're asleep, and Freddy has them running in circles. Cockroach Deb finally meets her end after struggling with her motel's amenities for a while. Freddy's giant eye peeps in as he bungles an eagle's lyric, You can check in, but you can't check out. And he finishes her long, drawn-out death sequence by crushing her within the box. Alice and Dan see Freddy standing in the middle of the road, so Alice floors it to wreck his shit, but instead she just wrecks the vehicle. Oh, and apparently she did that because she inherited Debbie's rage? Ugh, that whole thing is so dumb. In reality, Alice actually crashed the truck into a tree, which nearly killed Dan. GFJ, Alice. At the hospital, Alice realizes the doctors are gonna put Dan under anesthesia, which will leave him susceptible to a Freddy infection, so she rushes off to go prepare herself for a fight. And since time is so limited, you know what she needs. A montage! She gets dressed and accessorizes with all the crap her dead friends have left her, and then looks into the mirror and pretends to be cool. Fucking A. Dan is put under and wakes up in dreamland to Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Doc, what'd you say your name was again? Well, it ain't Dr. Seuss. Then Alice jump kicks through her mirror and winds up in the hospital room, okay, and unties Dan from his hospital bed. They run through a pipe with some classy supo squigglies cut out in the sides, and when Freddy appears on the other end, he starts spinning it around like it's some kind of crazy tunnel at DZ Discovery Zone. This is just silly, dude. What is Freddy even doing here? The kids crash through a stained glass window and fall into a church. Dan cuts himself deep in the process, and after it bleeds through into the real world, his doctors wake him up from the anesthesia. This yanks Dan out of the dream world and back to reality, leaving Alice alone as Freddy strolls into the church with a one-liner. Welcome to Wonderland! 
Alice. She uses her newly inherited karate skills to do a bunch of flippy dips and then punch and kick the crap out of Freddy like dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Although none of it seems to phase him since he just keeps laughing his dickish laugh the entire time. Eventually he tosses her across the room, but she gets back up and uses some MacGyver science bullshit to rig up a Ghostbusters looking blaster that zaps a hole straight clean through Freddy's torso. Freddy don't care though, he just waxes it off and tells Alice that he is eternal. But of course Alice has to be triumphant somehow, and the way it happens is drenched in weak sauce. Some jump rope girls on break in the rafters remind Alice of that Dream Master rhyme she's been yammering about this whole movie, which apparently ends like this. Evil will see itself. Yep, you heard right, evil will see itself and die. And I guess that's what's happening here as we rollick through Freddy's digestive tract and see all the souls that he's eaten. The souls start punching out of Freddy's body, and although I'm not a fan of that Dream Master rhyme ending, or really the whole chest full of souls thing in general, I will say that the effects here are absolutely awesome, and a great example of how combining different effect techniques can result in something beautiful. Oh, and one of the escaping souls is played by Scream Queen Linnea Quigley. She shows her boobs, of course. Eventually, all the escaping souls rip Freddy's jaw off and escape through his broken mouth hole leaving nothing behind but an empty sweater and a lonely finger knife glove. I am including this as a kill, and in retrospect, probably should have counted Freddy's death in Dream Warriors too. My bad. The happy soul heads fly past Alice as they escape through the window into the night sky. Alice leaves the church, which leads into a denouement that shows her and Dan together talking about how easy sleep has come lately. But when Dan tosses a coin in the fountain, Alice sees Freddy in the reflection. Or does she? I mean, she definitely did, but he's not there anymore, and who's to say what that means? Other than the fact that there would definitely be another sequel. But instead of worrying about future installments, we've got to focus on the now, man, and the kills that the Dream Master gave us. So let's see how bad of an idea wearing a green shirt was and get to the numbers. Oh hey, not bad. Seven people died in the Dream Master, as long as we're counting Freddy, which I will. The victims included four guys and three girls, which means Freddy once again killed his victims in a fair and balanced way. At a runtime of 93 minutes, that comes out to a kill on average about every 13 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Debbie. I love how drawn out her death is, starting with the elbow breakage and advancing to a stage five Gregor Samsa. The entire transformation looks great, and it's even got the fun dream loop thing going on while it happens. Easy winner in my mind. Dull machete for lamest kill goes to Rick, who died in that stupid fucking invisible karate scene with a stupid fucking flying glove stab. And that's it. A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, was released in 1988 and was the highest grossing Freddy film until 2003's Freddy vs. Jason. People loved it so much that a sequel came out just under a year later, and we'll look at that one, The Dream Child, next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching my Kill Count for The Dream Master. I want to thank some of my patrons like Will Sternick and Charles Hall. We have now left the nightmare movies that I love and are getting into the stuff that I don't love. I did wind up doing a live stream playthrough of the Nightmare on Elm Street NES game. If you missed it, click up there to see that video. But I will let you know that on Monday will be a Kill Count. And yes, it's a movie relevant to next week's holiday. I'll see you all then. Be good people.